Good morning and welcome back. Recall that we had broken the study of GPS into five pieces. You see them there. 1.6 was a snippet on satellites. We did that a couple of times ago. 1.7 was a snippet on the navigation message. We had good fun with that last time. Today, we're going to talk about the navigation signals. So that is the mate to the navigation message. This is the information that each GPS satellite sends. And um, it sends both signals and messages. And by the way, each GPS satellite sends three such pairs. But uh, let's not get into that detail quite yet. We'll just look at one of the navigation message, navigation signal pairs. Here we have a beautiful picture of one of the GPS signals. So bear in mind, each GPS satellite sends something like this several times over, in fact, three times over. And what we have here is a depiction of the most important GPS signal. This is the GPS signal sent at the so-called L1 frequency. L1 because it's in the L band of the radio spectrum. L1 also has the meaning link one. And it turns out that GPS, each GPS satellite transmits, broadcasts, three navigation links, and then some communication messages as well. So if we look at it closely, uh, the carrier is so well named because it is that part of the signal that carries the message from the radio transmitter to the radio receiver. And if we look closely, it's characterized either by frequency or by wavelength. So frequency is something that you could measure if you are able to stand at one spot and watch that wave whistle by you. And if you counted the number of these sinusoidal troughs or sinusoidal peaks that went by you in one second, the answer would be 1,575,42 million cycles per second. So we speak about that in hertz. Hertz is equivalent to cycles per second. So the capital M is millions of cycles per second. And then we have the 1575.42 megahertz for L1. Equivalently, if you were able to freeze the wave, so it just stops in space, and then you went next to it and you measured this distance in space, measured it in meters, you would discover that for GPS L1, this distance called lambda for wavelength is approximately equal to 0 0.19 meters. In other words, 19 centimeters. Now, you may ask, is there a relationship between lambda and F? And indeed there is, I'll write that right here. F is equal to C divided by lambda. The most important thing I encourage for you when you're working on radio is try and keep track of the units. F is in cycles per second. C is in meters per second. And lambda is in meters per cycle. So if you go through and you do that division of the dimensions of the units on the right-hand side, you'll see that that equation makes sense. This is a great way to make sure you've written the right equation and to check your work all across engineering. I certainly encourage it for people to work in the navigation space. Now, what next? We have the carrier. We'll come back to that in a moment. And at the next highest rate, the, next, uh, the thing that's happening at the uh, next highest rate in terms of speed is the code. And the code is very special to GPS. Um, it is the so-called spread spectrum code, and there's a unique code for each GPS satellite. So among other things, it can be used to identify which satellite you're listening to. And so you'll have a replica, you'll have a book of codes in your receiver, 
and it will say, oh my goodness, I'm looking for satellite number 29, and we call that PRN29, pseudo random number code 29, and you'll correlate it with the incoming signals, and you'll slide that replica around until it aligns with something that's coming in. And at that time, you'll, you'll know that, oh my goodness, I've found uh, PRN uh, 19 or whatever my example was. So we'll come back to this. For the time being, suffice it to say that it too has a wavelength, and these individual events in the code are called chips. So please commit that nomenclature to memory, chips. And uh, each chip is 300 meters long. If you think about it, there's a certain sensibility to that. If we want to use GPS to measure our position with an accuracy of around 3 meters, that means we have to resolve the arrival time of an individual chip to 1%. 1% of the 300 meter CA code wavelength would be 3 meters. So that means we're doing pretty well. Remember, our goal is to get 5 meter accuracy all told. So you certainly have to get down into the 1 meter, 3 meter kind of resolution when measuring the time of arrival of the code. I uh, invite you to consider the following experiment. If I'm the transmitter and you're the receiver, and you want to find out the arrival time of a signal coming from me, you consider the two, the following two alternatives. In the one case, I go, ooh. In the other case, I go, Pip. I hope you agree with me that the second one, being shorter in wavelength, is preferable. It's much more likely that you're going to be able to measure the arrival time of that wavelength rather than the very slow, smoothly varying one. So that's the idea behind these codes. We really want these chips to be short. By the way, when you look at the military codes from GPS, or the new civilian codes, not the uh, one described here, not the L1, but uh, the new ones coming at L5, then these chips, rather than being 300 meters long, are only 30 meters long. So that just pushes in that direction of greater resolution. At the same time, the code has a frequency as well, and it turns out that there are 1.023 million chips, each of length 300 meters, being clocked out per second for the so-called CA code, the Course Acquisition or Clear Access Code. So, we've talked a little bit about carrier, we've talked a little bit about code. Here's the nav message. We've already talked about that. That was our last snippet. We were talking about the nav message. This is that part of the signal which carries the information about the ephemeris and clock of a satellite. So we mentioned that each satellite sends these two strands towards you. One is the nav message shown here at the bottom, and then uh, we have the, the code above that. So let's talk a little bit more about the carrier. I want to go uh, one level deeper on this. And here is a picture of the radio spectrum. And um, it turns out that GPS lives in this L band way out in the middle. Of this picture. And we'll come to that in a second, but let's talk about the hole for a little bit. The radio spectrum is broken into bands, and one of the lower bands is called low frequency, LF. And so it includes all radio signals that have frequencies between 30 kilohertz and 300 kilohertz, or 3 times 10 to the 4th up to 3 times 10 to the 5th. Now remember, GPS has a frequency of 1.575 times 10 to the 9th, so clearly it does not reside in LF. If we go up to MF, we just multiply everything by 10. So the starting frequency is now 3 times 10 to the 5th, going up to 300 kilohertz, uh, and then uh, the right-hand side goes all the way up to 3 times 10 to the 6th. 
Now, we're kind of on our way here. Remember, GPS is 1575 times 10 to the 6. We're not there yet, but at least we're going in the right direction. HF stands for high frequency. It goes from 3 megahertz up to 30 megahertz. VHF goes from 30 megahertz up to 300 megahertz. That's where most early TV stations were. So television is very heavy in there. There's also a television in the next band up called ultra high frequency. So keep your eye on the adjective, low frequency, medium frequency, high frequency, very high frequency, ultra high frequency, super high frequency, extremely high frequency. That's just how the naming convention went as people went higher and higher in the frequency band. Um, in terms of satellites, the, most of them are between this 10 to the 9th and 10 to the 10th. That's because in that window, the Earth's atmosphere is transparent. So the signals can actually uh, go from Earth up to space and from space down to Earth. So most of the action occurs in there. If you get down below here, the ionosphere, which is one component of our atmosphere, becomes more and more opaque to radio and so that becomes more of a problem. As you go up here, the wavelengths are getting shorter and they're becoming more affected by the oxygen and water vapor in the atmosphere. So two very different effects kind of make satellite communications above a certain frequency unlikely and below a certain frequency unlikely. So GPS and all of that navigation satellite systems reside in this prime real estate right here in the middle. What we have here is just from one gigahertz to two gigahertz. So it's just an exploded view of what I called and colored L band on the last view graph. And all of the early civil applications of GPS make use of one frequency and one frequency only. This is the one that we've highlighted so far, so-called L1 frequency. And that is kind of, uh, this is a logarithmic scale, so L1, equals 1575.42 times 10 to the sixth cycles per second. More compactly, we would say 1575.42 megahertz, or equivalently, we might say 1.57542 gigahertz. So all of those things are the same. So in terms of the utility of GPS, this frequency rules. It's by far the most important, and that is the one for which about today, about two and a half billion, getting close to three billion GPS receivers have been built. Starting in 2005, the GPS receivers became more capable. They started to include not only an L1 signal, but an L2 signal. So I mentioned this earlier, that all told GPS satellites broadcast on three frequencies. Each one of those frequencies has the code in the carrier, so you get that pair of data streams going on three frequencies per satellite. Here's, a, for fun, a, a, a picture of uh, that uh, satellite that uh, was the first to carry the civil L2 frequency. And here we have a snapshot of the L2 signal in the frequency domain. So if uh, frequency domain is not something that you're immediately comfortable with, don't worry, we're going to come back to it but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a foreshadowing of the kind of pictures we would be looking at later on. And if you look closely, um, you'll see that it calls out a center frequency of 1.2276 gigahertz. That's equal to L2. 
And so that means that this reticle in this uh, figure is placed right there at L2. And if you look up over L2, sure enough, there's a, uh, a lobe there. And that lobe tells us that that signal is carrying quite a bit of information, quite a bit of signal, close to L2. And this narrow lobe is the civilian one. And this broader lobe is an underlying military signal. Now, I mentioned earlier on that the military signals are sent at 10 times the chipping rate. And that means that it will have a broader lobe. The civilian L2 signal is only sent at 1 million chips per second. So its breadth, when measured in the frequency domain, is only 10% of that of the military signal. So what's the good of having L1 and L2? It's enormously good. First and foremost, it's good for mitigating accidental radio frequency interference. The GPS signals are very weak. They come from far away, and so uh, when they arrive, they have a strength of around 10 to the negative 16 watts. And so that means any uh, transmitter that inadvertently or intentionally broadcasts on that same frequency can pretty easily overwhelm the GPS signals. So we'd like to have a backup. In case this one is knocked out, we'll use L2. If L2 is knocked out, we'll use L1. That's big purpose number one. Big purpose number two is that if you have measurements at two frequencies, you can cancel out the biggest natural error source, which is due to the Earth's ionosphere. We'll come back to that, but uh, hang on to that fact. It's an important one. Here's a, a much uh, uh, higher view of the radio spectrum. Notice that, uh, once again, I'm showing you a good chunk of uh, uh, L-band. L-band begins at one gigahertz, and it goes all the way up to two gigahertz or 2,000 megahertz. So I'm showing you kind of the lower two-thirds of the L-band. And within that, here at 1575 is GPS L1. Here at GPS L2, uh, is the 1227.6. Down here at L5, we haven't talked about this yet, but we will soon enough, is that third civil GPS signal. The Russians have a satellite system called GLONASS. Notice that they have more or less mirrored what we did with GPS. The Europeans have a system called Galileo. They too have gone to this three frequency system. And the Chinese have a signal system called Beidou, and they too have gone to the three uh, frequency system. Notice that these things differ in all kinds of details. They're not lying right on top of each other. They're a little bit offset. The Beidou and Galileo signals are broader than the GPS L5 signal, so they're trying to do something special there. Uh, Galileo and Beidou did not choose to use the L2 or G2 signals used by GPS and GLONASS. They're offset. They're a little bit lower in the radio spectrum. And so these top items are the, in fact, occupancy of the satellite signals in the radio spectrum. There's some experimentation going up, going on way up at so-called C-band, which is 5 gigahertz, but uh, that, that's not uh, anything that's going to be uh, in practice soon, so we, we'll avoid that in, in this course. Down at the bottom, we have names for these parts of the radio spectrum. So as you go through the radio spectrum, they've been allocated to different services all the way from uh, down at uh, low frequency straight on up into extreme, extremely high frequency. And the bands that are in force here in our part of the radio spectrum are the so-called Aeronautical Radio Navigation System Band, ARNS, or Radio Navigation Satellite System Band. So this means aviation is the primary user, primary authority of this band and this band. That turns out to be an extremely good thing 
for satellite navigation because aviation is very protective of the signals uh, in the AR and S bands uh, because they're there for safety of life. And of course, it's good to be in a band that's allocated for navigation satellites because that means that it, that band is built on and appreciates that the signals will be very weak. So they won't put very, very strong ground-based signals in those same bands. I hope this works for you as an overview of what's going on in the radio spectrum. It is one aspect of GPS. It's a complicated one, and it's, it's something that you should always keep your eye on. Here is a first look at the code. And uh, so these green chips are just that. In the case of CA code, bear in mind, remember, that width is about one microsecond in time, or about 300 meters in distance. And those chips follow each other, so if you were to listen to them, they would sound more or less just like a noisy sequ sequence, like a sequence of coin flips. So if you were to hear it, it would be something like just rattling along randomly. And they have special properties. These codes are called pseudo-random for a reason. They kind of sound random, look random, but they have a very carefully crafted structure. And that structure includes good autocorrelation property. So if you were to shift the replica back and forth in the receiver as part of your effort to find the in fact received signal, you'd find that when the replica was aligned with the actual signal coming into the antenna, that their correlation, of course, would be very strong. All the plus ones would be aligned with plus ones. All the minus ones would be aligned with minus ones. And if you multiplied that, plus one times plus one is one, minus one times minus one is also one, and you sum them all up, you would get a correlation peak, and that would indicate to you that your prompt is synchronized with the incoming. In contrast, if your prompt Sorry, your replica is misaligned. Here we show one that's late. Notice that it's misaligned by one whole chip. Then the correlation will be very weak. And so this is by design. The codes are designed for autocorrelation. We'll return to cross-correlation in a little while because they have a second property. Not only do they have this gorgeous peaked autocorrelation function, which unambiguously shows you the arrival time of the signal. They also have very low cross-correlation with the codes from other satellites. So you can go ahead and do this autocorrelation one satellite at a time without having to worry too much about the impact of the signals coming from other satellites. That brings us to the end of our introduction on navigation signals. Next we meet, we'll do a snippet 1.9 on pseudo-ranging. Thank you.